Hello everybody and welcome to this Whenever I Feel Like It's Q&A video where I answer viewer questions. Let's see what you guys sent in. Who was the best general of the Civil War? This time I asked you guys to send me in your historiography hot takes. Historiography, of course, being how history is written and how that changes over time and how it's remembered, I guess. Uh, this is an unscripted video, so, you know, it's going to be a, a disaster. <laughs> Howard Zinn, in A People's History of the United States, characterizes the American Revolutionary War as an effort led by the American bourgeoisie and slavers to redirect growing class and racial animosity toward them uh, toward them, the slavers and the bourgeoisie, against a common foreign enemy to prevent rebellion and ensure greater control. Chapter 4, page 59 to 75. Yeah, cite those sources, baby. To what degree do you agree? To what degree? To what degree? To what degree do you agree with Zinn's class and race-based analysis of the revolution? I think Zinn's take is uh, is pretty bad here, um, and I'll tell you why. So I think Zinn and his protégés tend to work backwards. Um, they already have their conclusion, and they are looking for evidence to support it. Uh, now, you know, race and class and those differences played a huge part throughout all of American history. I think with the revolution in particular, what I see a lot among uh, Zinn and his acolytes is uh, they ask the question, who benefits, right? Who benefited from the American Revolution? It was the bourgeoisie and the, the slave-owning uh, aristocracy. And I would just say, show me the evidence, right? Um, I, I really haven't heard a compelling argument backed up with primary sources to corroborate Zinn's point here. Um, I've seen it repeated quite a bit, but I, I just don't think, I mean, please prove me wrong, you know, um, uh, let me know if, if I'm totally off base here, but I don't think, you know, Jefferson or Rutledge ever wrote down, you know, yes, yes, we must keep the blacks enslaved and the working class down, and to this end, we shall rebel against the king. <laughs> How do you think that Lincoln would be perceived if he had not been assassinated? Would he have been vilified and hated by the lost cause similarly to Grant? Uh, I mean, Lincoln is hated by the lost cause. Uh, I mean, the, you know, the anti-Lincoln, Lincoln is a tyrant stuff. I mean, that's a huge part of it. Honestly, I think that if Lincoln had not been assassinated, he probably wouldn't be remembered as fondly. I think that's kind of the main thing. Um, you know, it's, it's kind of like if Jesus Christ lives to an old age, you know? Um, he wouldn't, you know, he would have, he would have said something horrible or, or, you know, or done something horrible. You know, like, uh, uh, I, I would think that Lincoln would probably be remembered a lot like Adams is, you know, where he is, he's sort of this like pioneer of, uh, of liberty and of uh, enlightenment ideals. And then, you know, he's typically thought of as like a really bad president, which has sort of tarnished his reputation. Um, I would disagree with that. Uh, analysis that that Adams presidency was just like one of the worst in American history. I, I think that's that's monstrously unfair uh, to him. But you know that said, Alien and Sedition Acts, pretty bad. You know, and he did he did he did make some pretty bad decisions. Uh, but well, what president hasn't? Maybe there's a video in there somewhere. How would someone writing a history remember to take the records lost and not written into account and not fall prey into believing that what's in front of them is the full story? You know, great question. Um, there's, I mean, you you really. I mean, you just have to, you just have to remember that, you know, that it's, that it's not the full story. You have to critically look at sources. You got to think about, all right, who is, who's writing this? Why are they writing it? Uh, are they trying to prove something? And then sort of take that into account when you're building your narrative, right? Um, and, you know, I mean, I, I've talked a lot of shit about Benjamin Church on this channel, and I, but I think he's a perfect example, you know? Um, somebody who is very much trying to secure their reputation for posterity in their memoirs, and, and he succeeded at, in, in that. I mean, it's only been very, very recently that Benjamin Church has not been regarded as, you know, a hero and, and you know, the, the, 
a dashing colonial rogue, you know, and, and now he's starting to, some of his less savory acts are like coming to light. I mean, a lot of the stuff that I've, uh, uh, the criticisms that I've had of, of his reputation come straight from uh, Lisa Brooks, uh, who wrote a book about King Philip's War called Our Beloved Kin. And then also from King Philip's War, you've got Mary Rawlinson, who wrote a, a very influential captivity narrative about her time spent with the Wampanoag after uh, Lancaster, her home, was attacked. She got captured and spent months with, uh, uh, with the Wampanoag. And uh, it's important to remember that she was writing, you know, a, a best-selling memoir. You know, it was a commercial enterprise. Uh, her narrative uh, it, it did very well back in England, uh, where there was a real appetite for that kind of stuff, you know, tales of the frontier. So you have to, you know, there is a lot of good information in there, and it is one of the only um, surviving contemporary sources that we have about kind of like what the Native Alliance was up to during King Philip's War, but you know, you do have to look at it through the lens of like, okay, you know, this lady is trying to titillate her audience uh, uh, in a lot of ways. And to a modern, from a modern perspective, you read it and it doesn't really read like that, but nonetheless, that's what she was trying to do. And you have to take that into account. I mean, for the vast majority of history, we have incomplete and biased sources, and that's all we have to go on, you know, I mean, if we're lucky, there's some archeological evidence. And you, so, you know, you do have to sort of fill in the gaps a little bit, and that involves a lot of guesswork, and sometimes you can guess wrong and make a fool out of yourself, you know, um, but no narrative of events, even for very well documented um, uh, historical events like World War I or, or the, the Civil War, uh, n none of them is going to be complete. And that's something I think about a lot, you know, I mean, um, you know, when I make a video, you know, like that last Leif Erikson Day video, right? And, and I'm thinking that whole time, you know, I'm thinking, okay, I've like gone over the saga and I've done research about the archeological evidence. And like, I think I've got a pretty good handle on it. But of course, I, you know, I imagine one of Thorvald's men or, or one of the, um, you know, maybe Beothuk Algonquin who shot him, uh, looking at my video and uh, from the afterlife and being like, <laughs> That's not how it happened. That's not how it happened at all, you know, and that's kind of unavoidable. Uh, you just have to do the best that you can with the sources that are available to you, I think. LOL, this won't be answered, but you're, you're goddamn right, it won't be answered. What are your thoughts on the 1619 movement? Do you think it is a valid historical way of looking at slavery in U.S. history, or is it solely a way of pushing some kind of political agenda, whatever agenda it may be? The 1619 uh, Project, I'm not sure sort of if the movement refers to something else, but the 1619 Project is a lot like True Blood. Uh, it's got a great premise, started off strong, but then about a third of the way through, it just sort of falls apart and, uh, and, and it's hard to kind of take it seriously after that. It's important to remember, 1619 Project was written by journalists, not historians. It's gotten a lot of flack from historians and oftentimes with good reason. And usually when talking about the 1619 Project, a lot of people, a lot of critics of it, seem to laser focus on sort of the worst assertion that it has, which is that the American Revolution was fought to preserve slavery, which is just not true. Um, and I think they laser focus on that because it's good political ammunition for them, frankly. And uh, in a lot of other cases with the 1619 Project, they're really just kind of making a mountain out of a molehill and uh, really should, uh, and, and they're using these oversimplifications and the bad history within the 1619 Project to basically discredit any alternative telling of American history that might be from the perspective of more marginalized people, uh, which is unfortunate. Uh, then you sort of take an ass another assertion, I don't know, uh, I don't remember exactly if the 1619 Project said this explicitly, uh, but what I've heard repeated a lot, especially online, is the idea of America being founded on racism. So that is, it's a oversimplification, but this literal statement is true. <laughs> it's true. The, even in the 17th century, going back to, to the colonial days, you know, um, uh, restrictions of the ownership of firearms seem to only apply to non-white people. In New York in the late 17th century, lantern laws prohibited any non-white people from uh, walking 
the streets at night without a lantern so that white people could keep an eye on them. I mean, and we talked about this a little bit in, in the uh, Great Swamp Fight video about sort of the idea of like, you know, of even before there was a sort of modern definition of what kind of race as we would define it today is, there were still racist laws, there were still racist people, um, and there was still racism. And uh, sort of getting caught up in the semantics doesn't really seem particularly constructive to me. Uh, I, I am all for using anachronistic terms to describe historical ideas, people, or events uh, just for the sake of clarity. I think there's value to, uh, in that. Um, especially in sort of a history 101 type of setting. You know, you, you got to be able to just present it in terms of people are going to understand. You know, once you get into sort of like proverbial higher courses, you know, uh, um, then important distinctions, uh, distinctions should be made. Is history really written by the victors? For example, the U.S. government let Nazis write their version of World War II from their side without the oversight of American historians to verify what was written. Um, no, no, history is not always written by the victors. Sometimes it is. Um, and, uh, and yeah, I mean, you know, obviously the stabbed in the back myth, the lost cause. I mean, there are many, many examples of history being written by the losers or of posterity being more sympathetic to the losers of a conflict. But I think sort of the whole question of was, of history is written by the victors or whatever, I think it, places a little bit too much emphasis on military history and on uh, wars being the great game of mankind, you know, uh, and um, to paraphrase uh, the judge from Blood Meridian, uh, you know, military history is certainly important, but there are so many other factors at play in sort of how societies develop, how cultures change. And uh, I think the military aspect is a small, and often overemphasized part of that. Do you think we should teach basic education with pop history more versus academic history if it means getting their attention? I think for younger kids, uh, yeah, definitely popular history. I mean, um, uh, elementary and middle school students are generally not gonna respond to that. But I think once you get to sort of like high school, you know, once the kids are old enough, then you absolutely should. Um, I think it, it's very. Um, I think it's 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 very important to do so. They can handle it, you know. I mean, you can't. Yeah, I mean, they're they're basically infants. They're not humans yet, but they. Uh, but you can't talk down to them, you know. You got to just sort of um, tell it like it is. And if that means that you're getting a little dry, then you know uh, whatever. Um, but uh, you know, you still have to present it in, in an engaging way. Um, actually, in middle school, I remember uh, one teacher that I had, uh, who was a great guy, who um, uh, demonstrated uh, how sort of, he was talking about historical sources, talking about primary sources, and the way that he demonstrated it was that he basically had everybody um, write, like gave, you know, everybody a worksheet or whatever, and had us write uh, what it was like to be alive in, you know, 2004 or whenever it was. And then he got all of the responses and, uh, and he said, okay, so, you know, we're imagining that it's a thousand years from now and here are all the sources about what life is like in 2004. And then he started like taking them and it was just like, oh, well, you know, uh, these four accounts burned in a fire and he crumpled them up and threw them across the room. And he said, uh, th uh, these accounts were deemed, um, uh, you know, offensive uh, uh, by a totalitarian regime. So he crumpled those up, threw them away, you know. Um, uh, these accounts, you know, uh, were lost in a flood, you know, and crumpled them up and threw them away. And then he only had one sheet left. And he was like, okay, so we have one account <laughs> and this is all that we know about the year 2004. And I thought that, I mean, that's always stuck with me. I think that's, that's a great way of demonstrating that, you know, um, and, uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, you obviously have to present it in an engaging way, but I don't think there's any reason why, at least not like older kids, you know, can't handle uh, the drier stuff uh, as long as, you know, the presentation is wet.
I'm a history major here. Maybe this isn't a hot take, this is just a bizarre observation. There was an assignment in a class I took spe speci specifically on historiography. We compared three textbooks that referred to the same subjects from a different year. We had a textbook from 1922, 1963, and the late 90s. The subject was about conquering and exterminating Native Americans. In a strange twist, while the most overtly racist, the 1922 one was the only one to actually refer to the Native Americans as nations with their actual proper names, like Iroquois Confederacy and other stuff, rather than tribes. It also seems proud of the conquest, like a list of enemies they've defeated. The others refer to them as a single group, just Indians or Native Americans. The 60s one had the least amount of information of the three and referred to them as one single block. It seemed to be trying to avoid controversy while still maintaining the colonialist narrative. While the 90s one was the least overtly racist, it was still condescending with the attitude that I felt uh, very much to be the same mentality behind the Pocahontas movie. Trying not to be colonialist, but really missing the point. Okay, interesting. Uh, yeah, no, I, honestly, I find that uh, this is the case quite a bit. I mean, yeah, there's, it's interesting, and, and I, I don't mean to keep bringing this back to King Philip's War stuff, but um, in... Douglas Edward Leach's introduction to his book about King Philip's War, Flintlock and Tomahawk, he basically makes the point, and this was written in 1958, so he makes the point that, like, from his perspective, you know, in the 50s, even 50 years before him, uh, you couldn't really talk about Indian Wars without um, there being, um, like, colonialist bias because that colonialism was happened in living memory. Uh, so, you know, he was basically saying that like we finally got into a point in the late 50s when we can kind of detach ourselves emotionally from these sorts of conflicts, which I thought was really, really interesting. And uh, yeah, and actually that's uh, an observation I've noticed about that book as well, as far as books about King Philip's War, is that Leach, you know, he would probably, he was probably a, a liberal by 50 standards, but He's, uh, you know, he uses all sorts of nasty names to refer to Native Americans, uh, racial slurs, um, including the name of a football team, quite a bit. Uh, but he's pretty sympathetic and uh, uh, to uh, the Native cause, you know. Um, and it is a very dated book, but honestly, he's like pretty even-handed with the way that he presents information. Do you agree with the modern narrative that the deaths of millions of Native Americans was genocide, as opposed to inadvertently exposing them to diseases they had no immunity to? Basically, can it be genocide if the perpetrators aren't doing the actual killing and or it wasn't deliberate? Um, so, I, th I broadly agree with it. I think the reason that it's called genocide uh, is because we don't have a better term for it. Um, it is technically inaccurate to call the, you know, 400 years of um, uh, European settlement in the Americas and in the Western Hemisphere as genocide because, you know, I think, I mean, you know, correct me if I'm wrong here, but it seems like, I think the literal definition of genocide is that it's orchestrated over a short period of time and it's like one group against another group, right? And that's not how it went down. I mean, you know, on the European side, you had the English, you had the French, the Spanish. On the native side, you had, you know, the Wampanoag, you had the Iroquois, you had the Sioux, Cheyenne, Comanche. You know, it, there were many, many different groups, many, many generations of people. Um, and, uh, but at the same time, I mean, sort of the end result was quite a bit like a genocide. I mean, you have... Um, a almost unimaginable number of people dead and displaced and marginalized in sort of a new order that then arose. Uh, and it really is completely unique to world history. I mean, the colonization of the Western Hemisphere was huge. And uh, I would argue one of the most important events in recorded history. Uh, and it almost seems like the term genocide doesn't go far enough for how much of a big fucking deal it was. What are your thoughts on placing present values on historical events and people? Should we view the past according to their understanding or should we view the past with our values? A little bit of both. Um, I don't really think that there's... I don't, I don't think necessarily that it's a bad thing to view the past with certain modern values. Uh, for example, the modern value of mass murder being bad, you know? I think that's a perfectly acceptable 
modern value to talk about, you know, when discussing history. Um, and yet those, there are those who will argue that uh, deploring a historical mass murder is bad history because, you know, you know, it's just the times. It's what things were like back then. But that said, you know, of course, we should be considering uh, contemporary morality when talking about a historical time period. Um, you know, but I, but the really bad stuff, I just can't really bring myself to do it. Um, you know, I, I do, you know, when talking about ancient Greece, I can't just say, well, you know, buggering a supple young boy was just how they did things back then, and we shouldn't judge. It's like, I'm, I'm gonna judge you on your, on your boy buggering, Socrates. Other historian here, do you personally favor postmodernist, neo-historicist, or synthesist epistemology? You seem to mix both postmodern narrativist expression with an at least partially materialist outlook. You fucking asshole. What do you think of historians using grandiose claims, such as the truth behind the legend in titles of their works? It's fine, man. You gotta get some, you know, you gotta get people to buy the book, you know? They gotta pick it off of the shelf at Barnes and Noble, so. How much has translation from language to language affected our records on much of our history and our knowledge of it? How much has the truth been changed, altered, lost, do you reckon, because of it? Also, your voice is like a fine wine to a single aunt. I love it. That's the first time I've ever heard anybody say anything nice about my voice. <laughs> um, uh, language and translation and transliteration affects an enormous amount. Whenever you're looking at a primary source that was written in another language and translated into English uh, or whatever language you know you you speak, um, you know I, unless you know that language really well, you gotta have that in the back of your mind when you're reading it, a hundred percent. Even f uh, especially for dead languages or more obscure languages, uh, there have been many bad translations of ancient texts and uh, it has led to a lot of misconceptions because of that. History is oversimplified in the modern day on a constant basis, so people who don't want to think can ignore the existence of nuance and not have their worldview challenged. I uh, disagree. I, I, I disagree with your assertion that this is a modern phenomenon. People have been oversimplifying history forever. <laughs> and uh, So, yeah, I don't think we should really be terribly surprised that people don't see nuance. People have never been particularly good with nuance. Hot take. In the future historiography of YouTube history channels, Brandon F's view on historical accuracy in films will be the accepted canon, and your view will be the revisionist view held by a few dangerous radicals who also believe pizza with pineapple is a good taste and Foster's is a magnificent beer. Foster's sucks, but pineapple pizza's fucking awesome. You can fight me on that. Um, obviously, this is uh, a terrible take. Hard disagree. Um, and, uh... Go fuck yourself. It appears to me that the way a European history is being taught in America, the history of Eastern Europe gets largely ignored. When it's talked about, it's mostly synonymous with the history of the Russian Empire and the USSR. Is my impression right? What are your thoughts about it? Uh, yeah, absolutely, dude. I mean, I'm of Eastern European stock myself, and, uh, you know, um, I'm half Serbian. Most people couldn't even point to Serbia on a map in this country. And, uh, yeah, I mean, there is a wealth of history. Uh, I recently uh, read the uh, Witcher books. Uh, and it really kind of struck me, you know, while I was just sort of like, you know, reading the Witcher subreddits and stuff like that and, you know, just kind of reading reviews or just sort of, you know, being like kind of into the Witcher for a while, uh, how refreshing the sort of Eastern European take on fantasy was to a lot of readers and a lot of, you know, gamers and, and stuff like that and, and uh, viewers of the show and whatnot, um, which is kind of crazy to me. And it really sort of goes to show how uh, specifically in historical fiction and in fantasy, there is such a laser focus on Western Europe. Grave robbing is only okay if it's brown people. Oof. Museums should return items taken from other cultures. For example, the British should give back items they take uh, they took when they were an empire. And an interesting reply. And what if the nation they came from lacks the ability to care for the artifacts and or safeguard them, or no longer exists? Yeah. The colonialist powers took a lot of shit from, from a lot of the countries that they, that they conquered, um, and that wasn't okay. Um, that said, let's look at the practical considerations here. Should the British Museum be burdened with uh, uh, the uh, 
financial and logistical problems of moving very delicate artifacts uh, half a world away. And I don't know, maybe the British Museum is, maybe there are good reasons for specifically the British Museum to do that, but I'm just using them as an example, you know. That's why I'm not in favor of removing Confederate monuments from the Gettysburg Battlefield, for instance, because the Gettysburg Battlefield can't afford to spend millions of dollars moving shit. You know, like, it's, it's not that I think those Confederate monuments are awesome, it's just that, like, why, why put the pressure on the park? Why attract that kind of negative attention? Because you know if they tried to do that, then all sorts of fucking nasty-ass people would come and with their AR-15s and with their fucking 3 percenter badges and shit and cause trouble and make life for the, the park rangers, for underpaid service industry workers in, in Gettysburg. They would just make their lives a living fucking hell. And why? to score some, for, for congressional Democrats to score some political points, please. Ah, and then the second comment, uh, what if the nation that came from lacks the ability to care for them? Again, let's look at, let's take the British Museum as an example. Do you think that London is gonna be a great safe place forever? No, of course not, you know? You think Britain is like, has their shit together now, you know, <laughs> let alone in a hundred years or whatever? I mean, you kind of have to think about long term and like, yeah, you know, Syria is war torn and Britain is not right now, but that could change. What are your opinions on Shelby Foote? A lot of people pass him off as a blatant lost causer, but I think there's something more. I'll, I'll not deny he has a Southern bias, but I personally thought his trilogy is a very informative piece of work and one of the huge reasons that I'm a Civil War buff now. I was interested in your views on him, since many consider him to be the Civil War Jesus. Uh, I, I don't hate Shelby Foote at all. Um, I don't, there, there are a lot of uh, historians today who have a very dim opinion of Shelby Foote, uh, which I can understand. Definitely a pro-Southern bias. Uh, he was not a historian, he was just a writer. Um, and many and his his perspectives interpretations is dated no doubt about that um that said you know when you take into account the time that he was writing when you uh take into account the fact that historiography is constantly changing and that it's only natural for the new generation to depart from the antiquated views of the previous generation i think a lot of shelby foote's worst sins can be forgiven um i think that yeah i think his books are very informative um, and uh, you know just dated. Uh, yeah, and I and I don't I don't blame Shelby Foote for th the widespread belief in the lost cause at all. Um, I think it's way bigger than him, and I think the lost cause was pretty firmly entrenched way before him. Okay, well that's about all the questions that we have time for. Um, well, I I actually do have time to answer more. I just don't want to. Um, but uh, I want to thank you guys for sending in all of your questions. Uh, seriously, I mean, these were some intelligent, tough, wonderfully nerdy questions. I truly appreciate y'all sending them in. And I love that I have such a thoughtful audience. I mean, that's just really means the world to me that you, that you guys are... Uh, smart. <laughs> and like, you know, putting forth interesting nuanced takes on the internet. That's a rare and wonderful thing, so keep it up. Um, I feel like there was something else I wanted to tell you. Uh, oh yeah, vote.